All right, folks, we're going to get started. Welcome, everybody, to uh, the River Conference. So uh, today's speaker is Marcel Pichuto. Marcel is well known to us in uh, the Transplant uh, Institute and the Division as one of our compatibility surgeons. He's also the uh, director of the Liver and Donation Liver Transplant Program, surgical director. So we're pleased to have him discuss that topic today. Thanks, Marcel. Thank you. All right, so we'll start talking about the process of living donation, but from our perspective, from the surgery perspective. Um, so as a background, we, we all know there are many patients waiting for transplant, not that, that many really achieving transplantation, only 44% of patients listed really undergo transplantation, uh, and there are patients that never get there. Uh, with a high increase of death in the waiting list. Um, so I mean to expand the donor pool is when living donation comes into play. But only 2% of, uh, of transplants are done with living donors. So it's a very small percentage of, of, of patients really accessing to even a living donor. So this is where we're standing. This is our center. And this was a decade ago, uh, where we had only 40% of our patients re receive a deceased uh, liver transplant. This is the national average, it's around 37%. Uh, uh, and we had a death in the waiting list of around 12%. That was almost a decade ago. Uh, at that time, uh, the, the percentage of patients uh, receiving a living donor was pretty low, around 1%. So from, from that situation, we started to encourage, it again, uh, living donation. Uh, and a decade later, this is where we are now. So um, the percentage of patients getting a disease donor dropped. You see, the national average was pretty much the same. And this is what we were talking just now with Gene. This is, this is because of units. At some point before, we were receiving all these organs from other states, uh, all these imports that after a national, more official distribution, we, we stopped receiving them. Uh, and um, our patients are still dying in the waiting list. The, the living donation rate increased to around 6%, so almost five, five six times increased uh, from the last decade but we still have a, a way, way to go. Um, so if we consider specific situations, and let's just consider patients with liver cancer, uh, an area that uh, I, I have a little idea of what's going on. Um, back in the 90s, we started to look at theoretical analysis, decision analysis, those are all that, that shows that if a patient with liver cancer uh, and, and get transplanted earlier with a living donor, this patient will have an increase in the life expectancy. And, and for any kind of intervention, if you can achieve at least six months of increase in the life expectancy, it's considered clinically relevant. Um, so if those patients in this mathematical model got transplanted with a living donor, uh, that they had to wait at least seven months to get to transplant, they uh, increase this life expectancy. Uh, and that was from theory uh, to, to then reality. One of the first centers that showed this was Toronto, uh, that compared how you deal with uh, liver cancer with other options, like in this case, liver sectors. So what they showed is that if you compare a patient going into a liver resection or, or going into a transplant, the results of transplants are much better than liver resections. Uh, but this is counting from the time of the surgery. But if we count from the time that you make the diagnosis of cancer, uh, meaning what is called intention to treat analysis, we see that the difference is not really there. Uh, this is because of the dropout of patients with progression of, of liver cancer while were for transplant. So this is this is the reality. When we make the diagnosis of cancer, uh, from that point, resection or transplant pretty much get the same outcomes. But 
if you compare again from the time of the diagnosis transplants and resections and you see that if these patients get transplanted less than four months from the time of diagnosis the uh, the outcomes of transplantations become statistically significant better than resection so if you transplant those patients early uh, you you have a improving outcome uh, we, we looked at our own patients, and this is a study that we compare disease donors with cancer from our center compared to uh, living donors from Japan. Kind of a little bit of different population, but you now what we show is that patients with living, uh, living donor liver transplants, they at least didn't do worse, and maybe even better on survival. But what's more importantly is that the recurrence of cancer was not really different. So meaning that this is a, a, a viable option for patients uh, with liver cancer. So in order to uh, consider liver donation, we really had to put a big team uh, in order to consider every single aspect in the evaluation of a living donor. Uh, that's why we have an independent donor advocate team, we need to really inform the donor of you know, what entails um, doing a living donation. We had to also assess the recipient on the other side uh, to make sure that there is a reasonable chance of success on the other side. Uh, and, and a lot of uh, perioperative care, a lot of planning, a lot of uh, support, emotional support to donors and surgeons doing this. Uh, in order to achieve a living neural liver transplant. So the first thing we need to know is the terrain. We, we really need to know the anatomy of the liver in order to know if it's possible to, to split the liver without damaging uh, neither side, the one that stays in the donor and the one that goes to the recipient. Um, uh, and we go all a long way from how Da Vinci uh, described the liver to what we know now. So now, this is, this is the functional units of the liver. This is how we really plan a surgery, um, not just only the anatomical landmarks, but also how, how every single part of the liver is functioning. Uh, so th this is extremely important. This is page five of, uh, of the Bible of liver surgery. That's a Blumgart, uh, that we really know it, had to know it by heart. Uh, we need to know also the, um, the uh, not abnormal abnormalities, but variations that the anatomy of the liver has in order to, to plan a surgery or sometimes even rule out a donor for surgery. Uh, this is, this is a, a case where uh, everything was kind of in the wrong place. Um, so this is a, a right-sided round ligament. So that little tiny dot I really missed. Um, it was on the wrong side of the liver. The gallbladder that is supposed to be on the right side was on the left side of the liver. Um, so this is a right-sided round ligament and left-sided gallbladder. Uh, and that everything was on the opposite side. So during surgery, uh, we had to start cutting the liver on the other side of you know where all the vascular structures go to the left. Pretty scary. Uh, you know, with, with tools, ultrasound, we managed to really uh, make sure that everything on the left side will stay uh, patent and, and, and we were able to uh, have good results. Uh, it was pretty, pretty scared, you know, doing uh, conventional surgeries with different uh, anatomies, but it's just something that we learned that we really need to play, uh, plan ahead before going into surgery. Other important uh, anatomical variations is how, how the liver drains. Uh, how's the anatomy of the of the paddock veins and essentially how's the drainage of the middle part of the left side uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this later but this is this is very important to plan sometimes shifting the risk from the recipient side to the donor side and something had to do with this independent drainage of segment four the middle aspect of the left lobe of the liver so when when we planning um, living donation, the most common surgeries we do if in the other side is a recipient is taking the right side of the liver. 
And as you can see here, this is the line where, where I divide the liver. And this is the middle hepatic vein that most of the time stays on the left side to make it safer for the donor side. It makes sometimes more complicated from the recipient side because they had to do a lot of technical uh, reconnections uh, in order to uh, restore the drainage of the anterior aspect of the right side. When on the recipient side we have young adults, small adults, so sometimes we are able to uh, remove the left side from the donor and plant the left side on the recipient. And for pediatric patients, uh, most of the times what we remove from the donor is the left lateral segment. So it's around half of the left side. Um, so, so we started planning, looking at images. And also, again, we go away from where we were looking before, little tiny frames of CAT scans uh, from what we have now, that we, our radiologists give us a lot of uh, information with volumetrical uh, uh, measurements uh, of, of both sides, right and left, uh, 3D of what we think we're going to find during surgery. The same is for the left lobe exactly where we need to cut the liver and how much is the volume uh, on each side. Um, also give us a lot of information about anatomical and in particular it's very important if we plan to take the left side of the liver. This is the biliary system, uh, this is the left bal bal duct, this is the right anterior and here is where the right posterior comes up. So if we don't know that we if we cut the left bile duct close to this, we can damage the drainage of the right posterior side of the liver. So this is crucial information that we know where to need to cut the bile duct if we take the left side of the liver. Um, in order to know if what we see on images really has some kind of correlation with what we're going to see during surgery, we look at uh, 137 right lobe uh, living donors we did here. Um, so from those uh, donors, uh, we calculated the volume uh, that was given us from um, from images. So the right lobe was around uh, 1,000 cc, around one kilo, and, and we compare that that we knew before surgery to what we saw in surgery after removing the right side of the liver. We weighed it in, in, a, in, a, in a back table, and uh, the average weight of that right lobe was 800 grams. So from 1,000 to 800 grams. Uh, but most important than the numbers, we knew that there is a very strong correlation from what we see in images to what we see in the uh, operating room in the back table. So uh, very, very, very uh, strong correlation with around 20% overestimation uh, from what we see to what we have in, in, in the back table. So for a 1,000 cc uh, liver uh, measured on, on images, we have 100 grams on back table. You can argue which of these two is, is the real one, the one we see on images or the one you see waiting in the back table with no blood inside. Um, I, I tend to believe that this is the real one in life, uh, but but no one really has the right answer. Uh, this is the, the 95 confident, uh, 95 percent confident interval of, of the regression line. It's pretty tight, mostly on the middle aspect. So let's just go for a second on the recipient side, just just for a minute. Then we'll go back on the donors. Um, and on the recipient side, the, the transplant team. Um, had to kind of answer a question, how much is too little for them? Um, so how much they can receive and make sure that it will work fine on the recipient side? So the number, the number to remember is, is this. It's around 1% of the body weight. So the amount of liver should be around 1% uh, of the recipient body weight. Uh, the, the numbers on paper is 0 0.8, but 1% is easier to remember. Uh, but it's not just only a matter of size or volume, it's just also a matter of how sick the recipient is. Um, and one of the first ones to, to 
addressed this issue was one of our fellows uh, here um, that, that compared uh, graphs that were small, so less than this number or higher than that number, and compared to the uh, child score of the recipient. And as you can see here, uh, if you have a graph that is on the big side, uh, it, it does very well in child safe patients, 88% uh, one year survival, the same if for uh, child's B and C's. And if we look at small, small graphs, we see that they even do well in patients with child's A. Uh, but here is the worst combination, small graft, sick patients. The survival rate drops to 33% at one year. And that's what happens when we started doing this. Uh, we started with doing left lobes that were too small, and we didn't realize that this was an issue, and we were putting the liver and removing the liver, until we, we understand that, no, we can make these combinations, small grafts with sick patients. Uh, this was validated, uh, again, from, from Toronto, uh, with this study, a major scale study, showing that you can use small grafts, but you have to be sure the patients are not really sick. The only independent predictor of, of liver fa failure or small foresight syndrome was the male score of the patient. So if you have a very, very sick patient, not even think about going for small graphs. So you think that's a reflection of portal hypertension? You know, I think the child pew, even though we don't use it, use it so much anymore, it's a pretty good reflector. Of yes, absolutely. So that's one, one factor that we, we take into consideration. Um, so, so again, we are still on the recipient side, and, and factors that really can affect uh, small foresight effect or or graph failure, uh, there will be some recipient factors, and for hypertension is one, uh, male, child, clinical status, age. So those things we, we really take into consideration when, when from the donor side we say, okay, this is what we can do. Uh, and then they assess with this amount of graph, you know, how sick is the recipient and, and if it's possible really to match this graph with the condition of the recipient. From the donor side, we look at donor factors uh, to kind of predict how this graph will function. I'll talk about this later. Uh, and then, then technical factors of uh, anatomical reconstructions and things like that. So now let me go back to the donor side. And, and the questions we ask from this side is, how much is too little? How, how much we can take uh, from, from the donor and, and have it remaining part of the liver that will function well and, and regrow? Um, so, so the number to remember is this one. We can safely take around 70% of the liver, meaning that we should leave at least 30% uh, of the liver inside the donor. There are confounding factors that we take into consideration, like fat, age, and gender, uh, uh, but volume is, is, is the first one that we look into. Um, if we compare the experience with donors with you know, resections for other, other reasons, you now we have a patient with cancer and we had to remove more than 70%, well, you now we kind of are obligated to check the risk uh, to go even lower than 30%, but not with dollars. We don't want to risk a healthy person. Uh, so we look back on all those 137 right uh, living donors uh, we, we studied, and looking on the donor side, uh, the re remnant liver volume was around 500 cc, and that represented 35% of the total liver volume. So we were above our 30% cutoff. Um, this is kind of the natural history that what that could happen when you don't have enough liver. Uh, so after after a major hepatectomy, you see that the bilirubin goes up uh, and at some point starts to go and starts to normalize. The same as the abnormal clotting factors, uh, they get fairly abnormal, and at some point it tends to go back to baseline. So if by day four or five we don't see that trend going into the right direction, you have 50% chances of liver failure. So from liver dysfunction, 
uh, based on labs, you can get to liver failure if by this day uh, these numbers are not getting better. 50% chances. Donor or recipient? No, this is there's a natural history of, of uh, resections in patients uh, for cancer. Right. Okay. But this is what we know that could happen. And we don't want even to get there. Um, we, we look on these variables that was Billy Rubin and, and INR. Mm -hmm. so, so when we try to answer that question, how much is too little? Besides, the first factor we look is volume. You know, how much liver we gonna, uh, uh, it will stay in the donor. Uh, uh, and you see there's a very strong correlation between the remnant liver volume and the INR on the donor. So if we, if the retinal liver volume is around th uh, 30%, uh, the INR doesn't go higher than two. When you start going uh, below 30% that we've done, uh, maybe not really knowing it at the time, uh, the INR can go higher than two, even, even two, and a half, two and a half. So we know that, that the volume of the liver is an independent predictor of liver dysfunction, I would say. It's just laboratory abnormalities. Uh, the other factor is age. Uh, the, the older the, the donors, uh, the higher the bilirubin. And uh, here you can see uh, at age 30, yeah, bilirubin doesn't really go higher than 2, 40, 2 and a half, 50, uh, your bilirubin goes as high as, as 3 uh, average. Uh, at day four. So that's another independent factor, age, that we take into consideration when we make a decision to uh, evaluate the donor. Gender, it's another very important uh, indicator. Uh, uh, donor, uh, female donors, uh, the bilirubin, the average bilirubin is, is, uh, is normal, usually, you know, between one to two. Uh, on males, uh, bilirubin is above two. Uh, so, so that's another factor. Males don't take this surgery as, as good as female. Uh, so if you put into consideration a small liver, uh, older donor, and, and, and a male, it's kind of a combination looking for trouble. Uh, sometimes we have the, the, the opposite problem. The problem is maybe the graph is too big, or there are too many things inside. The first one we look is fat. Um, these are two pictures of an MRI. Uh, this is an uh, in phase and it's an out of phase image of the liver. You see how dark it is. That's that's indication of fat, um, and, and that's just, that's also very important for us because if there is fat there, the volume on the remaining side is not really a parasite and it will not work as 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 we wish. Um, we usually don't do biopsies these days. Our radiologists give us an accurate percentage of fat in the liver, so it's very, very rare that we need to biopsy uh, these, these donors. And, um, and if we see that there is more than 20% of fat in the liver, uh, in addition to maybe some mild uh, transaminase elevations, these patients are completely contraindicated for donation. When the amount of fat is around 10 to 20%, you, you can encourage diet. Uh, uh, and maybe maybe the, the the fat will go down. I remember once I went to to Japan, and uh, it was funny uh, when they have these situations. They admit the donors to the hospital. They keep the donor for two weeks, eating uh, hospital food, and they achieve very good results. <laughs> um, but um, but that really helps. Really really helps. Here we give it around three months or so to, to lose a couple of pounds. Do you work with a dietitian to explicitly? Yes, yes, yes. Nutritionists give a, you know, an amount of uh, pounds they need to lose, and then we rescan the donors. Uh, if the fat is less than 10%, it's good to go. So, in sort of borderline cases where you're going to proceed, do you do a, a correction factor in terms of remnants? You know, do you have certain So, you, let, let's just say let's just say you are less than, than 10%. You know, if you are uh, closer to 2 or 3, you really don't do any correction factor. If you are closer to 10, uh, then then kind of consider if this is a very small retinal liver 
or not age and, and, and gender and, and there's nothing really written but this kind of adding another another risk so it's not it's not like black and white you know, if you add a little bit of that and a little of this, a little bit of that, and then sometimes you say, you know, I probably, this is too risky. I would say no. Um, another time that too much is a problem is in, in pediatric uh, uh, liver transplantation. Usually it's the left lobe. Uh, the left lateral segment and um, and sometimes even the left lateral segment is too big for a small baby um, so so you know we give volumetric assessments we did reconstructions and, and kind of the number to remember is this that the graph should not be bigger than five percent of the baby uh, body weight um, and and sometimes the donors are, are big fathers, big fathers, and they had to give a left lateral segment that it's really too big for the recipient. Uh, in that case, are you going to tell us? I mean, can you restrict how much you uh, remove in the OR, or do you trim it before you put it in the patient? So, so, so when when we have that situation, we we need to see, uh, and we we work a lot with our radiologists to see. If we what we can do to decrease the graft uh, will be still a, a in small enough for the recipient, and this is this is a case uh, where we uh, plan to do this to remove uh, segment two of the liver. So this will end up being just only segment three, um, and uh, and this is how it looks. This is a mono segment, and by planning. On images, we think that this part, this mono segment, would be small enough for the recipient. Is when we go ahead and do it. So we take the entire left lateral segment, and on the back table, we reduce it to just one segment. Um, so after all the evaluation of donors, only thirty percent are clear for for donation, and this is counting from the time. The donors are being evaluated. If we just count from the time they they call, just to to say they want to be a donor, so from the initial screening, that number drops to 20%. So one out of five from here, one out of three from the evaluation. Uh, so after kind of knowing what we're facing, then we need to plan the surgery, uh, and that's where we spend a lot of time from the surgery side. Can you go back to the previous slide? Like, just for the fellows, of the different things like you know, psychosocial and anatomical, which what can you give us a breakdown of uh, the, the main reasons for why patients are not eligible? So I, I I I come into play here, not here. Uh, so from from the code, there's many men on that triage that they've been uh, discarded because of uh, not really good clinical condition, heavy smokers, drug addicts, and things like that. But from here, from donor relations, it's done they come to the hospital to have the scans and see all of us. Uh, the main limiting factor is anatomical variations. You know, how the size of the, of the right side, the left side, the anatomy, vessels, bile ducts, and that accounts around 60, 60, 70% of the uh, donors that are ruled out. Um, so when we say, okay, we can do this, then we start planning the surgery. Um, so we started very big. We started with a huge incision, the same as, as we do for liver transplantation. Uh, and from there, we started to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and more complicated for the donor surgery, as, as much as we get smaller. Uh, so from a big Mercedes Benz, then we started with a J incision. Then with a single incision here with a couple of ports, to start moving the liver with, with uh, laparoscopic tools and then doing the surgery in the middle uh, to, to what we are doing now is just doing the surgery with, with a 10, 11 centimeter incision in, in the middle of the, of the abdomen. Um, so we looked at around 60% of our living donors that uh, underwent right low resection. Um, the, the mean volume of those right lobes are around a kilo. Um, 
And, and we did all the steps of the surgeries, from mobilizing the liver to do the hilar section to cut the liver from a single incision here in the in the midline. But we had to take, you know, one kilo liver from a 10 centimeter incision. Sometimes it's difficult to remove it. It's like we, we can't put the hands and, and take the hands and the liver with a small incision. Um, so these are the complications we had. And as you can see, where all complications were clavian 1 and 2, that means complications that didn't have any uh, permanent uh, consequences. You know, classification, clavian classification goes to, uh, up to 5. Um, so, so we're mainly 1 and 2. Around 36% of the donors uh, got some degree of complications. That is counting everything. Everything that deviates the donor from going home in a straight five, six days after, after the surgery. The most scary ones I had uh, were here. This one. These two they needed surgery to be corrected. One is a biliary structure, and another one is a, a, a poor vein thrombosis. Both, both cases uh, needed surgery to be fixed. Uh, there was, um, the patients remain, went back to normal life without any consequences. So uh, this is how we do it with a small incision here in the middle. Um, and, and, and we learned a few pitfalls. Uh, anatomical variations that we really want to stay away because this is also risk for problems. This is a case where there are two portal veins going, two separate portal veins going to the right side. So you really had to cut them separately and uh, that created two stumps and and that makes a huge like angle turn from the main portal vein to the left that, that after closing the abdomen can can uh, create a very acute angle and, and block the portal vein and produce thrombosis. So this patient we had to take him the day after the resection, post up day one to surgery, take the clot out and, and reconstruct the flow. Patient did fine, but he needed an extra surgery. Another, another situation where, where is, is higher risk of having problems when we have this, this is the biliary system with multiple uh, bile ducts. Here in this case, there were uh, two bile ducts to the left and three bile ducts to the right. And, and in, this, in this case, one of these bile ducts to the, to the left uh, got a uh, structure that needed to be reconstructed two or three months after after uh, donation. Again, did well, but, but it's a scary situation that we, from this time, we try to avoid. Um, it's very important to plan the surgery with anesthesia. Here we are very lucky that we have a dedicated liver anesthesia team, so we don't really need, need to talk to them. They know exactly what, what we need, um, and, and that's very, very comforting. It's one thing less that you need to worry about. Uh, they know that we don't need central lines, they need to manage the patients with peripheral lines, they, they know how to avoid congestions of the graft. <coughs> so it, it's very, very reassuring that you have people that know exactly what to do. Um, we also know that if we are in trouble, you know, we always need to limit intraoperative blood loss. This is the most important dependent factor to complications after any kind of liver resection. Uh, we know that we have tools to uh, control problems, uh, what is called um, vascular control. There are many ways to do it, and for intermittent ways, uh, uh, permanent ways to block the blood supply to the liver in order to fix blood loss. Uh, most of the common one is the Pringle maneuver. And, and, and we, we know that uh, either way it's, it's helpful, and most importantly, uh, one of our former uh, chiefs here, Dr. Miller, proved that we can do this safely in, in donors, in right lobe donors. So in case we need it, because there is a problem in the brain room, we'll be able to clamp and that, that's safe for the donor. Um, what we do during surgery is we, we, uh, we clamp this transiently, the blood supply to the right side, just to know where is the real division between right and left, because you don't see that division. There is no anatomical landmark to see. So we block, block the blood supply to the right side to know exactly where the right side and the left side joins. 
here is where the middle hepatic vein is. So we consider that kind of a precondition, ischemic precondition to what is going to happen next is just dividing the liver. Um, when, when the, again, when the recipient is a pediatric case, uh, what we do is a resection of the left lateral segment and trying to keep these structures uh, uh, ready to be implanted on, on the recipient. We have several technical maneuvers that help us uh, make the surgery a little bit more um, safe and, and easier, like, like for example, hanging maneuver is trying to bring the liver to you and work everything through uh, a, a midline axis. Um, so we normally, when, when we do a right hepatectomy for living donors, we divide the liver on the right side of this vein, the middle hepatic vein. So I mean, these segments here, the anterior segments of the right side, they have these tributaries going to the middle hepatic vein that need to be cut, and, and these, these tributaries need to be reimplanted on the recipient. So in a way, it's kind of shifting the, the risk and the complications to the recipient side. Makes, makes it more difficult for the recipient in order to make it safer for the donor. And that's usually what, what, what we do in right uh, low protectomy. There are situations that we shift the, the, the risk to the donor and, and keep this middle part grain on the right side. Now, I'll talk about that later. But this is the most common scenario. Uh, you see here in that, like dark blue is the congestion of these anterior segments of the liver um, after we, we cut those tributaries. So this is an indication that those tributaries need to be reimplanted on the recipient side. And, and that's what's uh, happening on the recipient side. This is what Dr. Florman does. He had to reconnect all these uh, tributaries to drain the anterior segments of the liver. Uh, so there are different, different ways to do it. This is uh, using uh, saphenous veins, as we used to do uh, many years ago, to reconstruct this drainage. Um, we, we also uh, published how to use the, the recipient middle hepatic vein, save that vein to use it as, as a drainage. That would be kind of the natural uh, way to reconstruct it. Um, and uh, this is how it looks after, you know, completely open. Uh, uh, and sometimes, uh, we can use the umbilical cord. The umbilical cord, you know, after after birth is completely obliterated, but you can successfully recanalize it in around 80% of the times. And you can get a good 10 centimeter graft uh, with like one centimeter diameter uh, that you can use to reconstruct those tributaries. Uh, uh, we we study those those veins, and in 70%. 73% of the times there is endothelial lining in those umbilical cords. So it's a perfect graph. You have it just there for you. Uh, this, is, this is how it looked uh, in, in the recipient when it's reconstructed. So these are the tributaries, you know, segment 5 and 8 veins, and the umbilical vein draining into uh, the uh, middle hepatic vein. And this is the umbilical graph. Uh, this is how it really looks in the back table, all these little holes that uh, Dr. Florman puts together, uh, sometimes puts the graft, and then implant it into the recipient. So this is, again, right lobe. This is where we usually cut, uh, you see, on this side of the middle hepatic vein. Uh, the rest is more on the recipient side than on the donor side. Um, sometimes we shift the line to, uh, towards the left and, and leave this middle hepatic vein with the uh, recipient. That will be easier uh, on the recipient side because it's better uh, decompression of this side, this side of the right lobe, but intenser risk on the donor side. Uh, so we studied this situation. Uh, we had 12 cases where we removed the middle hepatic vein, um, and and we we realized that you know, the left side has a middle segment, a segment four, and the left lateral. Uh, uh, we know that um, the, the entire left lobe will grow, and we know that, uh, and usually the left lateral segment grows much more than, than the middle aspect, segment 4, but if you remove the middle hepatic vein, 
that segment four will grow even less. Uh, and that's really critical. Uh, if you have a big segment four, if most of your left side is, is segment four, and you remove that middle lymphatic vein, uh, you are putting at risk regeneration of the retinal liver volume. And this is kind of what I say when this is a ratio here in between left lateral segment and segment four. So the bigger the segment four, the less regeneration of the entire left lobe. Um, so that's something really to take into consideration. This is a ca uh, images of left side. This is uh, a patient that got resected at uh, the right lobe with the middle lymphatic vein. Uh, here, uh, this is segment four. And this is one year later. There is a growth, but you see a huge difference between the left lateral segment before and after, and not really much difference between uh, segment four. Um, so after a year of donation, uh, the, the increase in size of segment four was just only 21%. Another situation is when there is an independent uh, drainage of segment four, not just the middle lymphatic vein. So there is an extra vein that drain in that that segment four. So even if we take the middle lymphatic vein, but we save that independent uh, segment four drainage, the growth of the segment four will not be impaired. Uh, and in this situation where there is that independent drainage, uh, the increase of segment four was at 128 percent. How does that reflect clinically or in biochemistry? Difference? I mean, if, if the left lateral is okay, and no, not not really, not really, because um, the main the main situation is when you have a big segment four, uh, and all those things we knew beforehand. So when we had a big segment four, we didn't even try to do this unless there is an independent segment four drainage. But but the um, the laboratory abnormalities were not significantly different. So I, what I, the way I look at this, this is just one step before a clinical implication of a problem. Sometimes we see changes in the labs, but nothing really much happens. But we don't, go, we don't want to go from lab abnormalities to clinical implications. So when we do that, when we shift the risk to the donor, uh, it has to be a perfect donor, very young, uh, with this independent drainage, um, we also with a real, um, real need on the recipient side. This recipient is, is very, very sick, uh, a lot of poor hypertension, the graph is not that big. Uh, so in those situations that are very, very selective, we can shift the rest to the other side. Um, so this is how it looks in the back table. Uh, this is the right uh, hepatic vein, this is the middle hepatic vein. Uh, and here is the put together uh, before implantation. Um, this is how it looks. Uh, then we send the liver to the recipient side. Uh, here is the floorman. We give a little bit of good luck there and, and we go back to the donor side. <laughs> um, so, overall, donors uh, stay in the hospital around six days. Um, complications. Uh, all type of complications, around one third, they have some complications. Uh, worldwide uh, incidence of complications, 2% bleeding, 4% biliary problems, uh, and 0.5% risk of mortality. And, and, and this is what really drive us to be extremely selective in, 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 in evaluating the donor. Um, from, from our patients, we, we knew that uh, a, a couple of, of issues are independent predictor factors of complications in donors. And essentially, it's how difficult the surgery was. Measured as the amount of cell saver uh, blood that we retrieve and get back to the donor, and, and the amount of uh, increase the transaminases and post op day four. So those two, those two are in the, uh, independent predictor factors of complications and reflects how, how difficult the surgery was on the donor side. Uh, on, on the recipient side, um, we, we, we know that 
there is a much, much bigger surgery, they need to clamp every single vascular supply around the liver, um, and then they need to implant, in, uh, implant all these vascular tributaries that, that we removed. Uh, so it's a very, a very, um, uh, very difficult surgery. They need to implant every single, single structure there. Um, this pediatric world. Uh, this is the left lateral segment implanted in, into into the recipient. Um, the, these are the ten year results. You see, at ten year, uh, the the survival of uh, of living donor uh, liver transplant recipients it's above eighty percent. Ten year survival of pediatrics. Uh, this is Mount Sinai experience. Uh, this is on the adult world. Well, this was one of the first uh, um, uh, series uh, published uh, from Tokyo, from Sinai, uh, showing uh, results, very good results, long-term results, five years results, 80, 90 percent. Um, so on the recipient side, uh, overall good results, similar to disease uh, uh, liver transplants. Um, complications, yes. Uh, there is maybe a little more morbidity uh, of, uh, of transplant with living donations and disease donors because everything is half size and more things should reconnect. So there's always more chances of having complications. Um, so in conclusion, uh, when, when we consider a donor uh, uh, to do this type of surgery, we really have to have a conscious donor selection. Uh, we, we need to know, you know what, what we have in front of us. We, we try to plan it as detailed as we can and, 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 and play attention to every single aspect of the entire process since the donor gets into the hospital until the donor goes home uh, in a week. Um, so complications, it, it's really uh, something that drives us to be as, as, um, as accurate as possible. Um, we try to select the donors, try to pay attention on, on factors of, uh, of liver dysfunction, uh, and we try to really have a very, very impressive perioperative care for these donors. There's always a human part, human aspect of living donation, that uh, there's always a story to tell. And, and this one is, uh, it's, it's, uh, this is an ex-marine that, uh, he, he accidentally found out that uh, there was a woman in his small town in Illinois that was in need of a transplant. So he became an uh, altruistic donor. He, he didn't know her. But uh, hey, you never know. Uh, living the nation maybe is, uh, is the start of a beautiful, loving story. And they got married after that. That's it. <laughs> Um, what is the data about long-term uh, health of donors? Are they more susceptible to, I mean, apart from the media post office, are they more susceptible to other liver diseases, to alcohol, to obesity? Do we know? Um, we don't. Uh, we always are considering that. You know, for example, we have a donor with uh, maybe 10 to 15 uh, percent steatosis. And we say, okay, when you have diet and uh, lose a few pounds, get the fat out of the liver and go to, to surgery. What happened with those donors long term? We don't know. Um, in regard to surgery, technical long term complications of surgery, we do know that the surgery uh, itself that does not have an impact in long term complications, in long term outcomes in these donors. Um, uh, we started doing this in 1998 for for recipients, so it's, we don't have that many years, that many decades going on. But we yeah. we do know that similar situations, like like um, patients that needed a me for let's say a benign condition 30, 40 years ago, um, uh, those patients these days do not have any complications regarding that surgery 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and we assume that those patients 
even though maybe they were benign conditions, may not have been as healthy as the donors we have these days. So, um, technical issues, we think that there is not really any major impact. But, you know, regarding fat, regarding uh, lifestyles, uh, they, they behave well to get to this, but the risk is they may go back to their health habits after this pass, and then they have a surgery and maybe a fatty liver in the future. I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Is there, a, is there any data that suggests like a certain like, whether it's a data, a certain like null cutoff or like relative contraceptives, any data support that? I've heard like the number 25 turn around, but. Yeah, so, so the, the, the question is um, what, what, what are the chances of success uh, on, on, that, on that recipient? And, and it had to be a reasonable risk or a reasonable chance of success on the recipient side to put the donor at risk, right? <coughs> so, so there's not really a strict cutoff, but let's just say we move kind of around melt of 25, would be uh, above 25 would be a little bit too sick, uh, because maybe the risks on the recipient side were higher to, to, to put the donor at the risk of a surgery. Uh, before there was absolute contraindications to do this for acute fulmen and liver failures. Now we are start talking about it, just talking about it, but we haven't done any. Uh, before there was uh, absolute contraindication for redos, retransplantation. Now we are kind of debating it. Okay. Uh, the same as recipients with poor ring thrombosis. That they need to have a graft, jump graft to supremus and everything. So it's another risk that you put there. We didn't, we didn't do it, but now we are kind of more open. So it, it's a very important assessment on the recipient side that maybe you can take one risk factor, but the other ones are all pretty good to say, okay, well, we can accept this situation. So along those same lines, people have sicker than their mouth and poor life. Do you do anything in the ER to like modify their flow to reduce the risk of smaller size, like slightly Yeah, so so sometimes Dr. Florman um, that does some type of manipulation. Uh, the most common one he does is, is put the patients on octrotype uh, to decrease the poor flow. Uh, in, in very rare occasions he can ligate the splenic artery. Uh, that would be a transient decompression to the spleen. Here we haven't done it. Uh, in Japan, for example, they do um, routine splenectomy for donors, just to decrease the amount of poor hypertension. I, this is a sort of related question, which has to do with what happens to the vasculature during the regeneration process, whether it's in the donor or the recipient. Because obviously you, you have fewer vessels for the same amount of blood, right? So do the vessels get bigger so they each one can carry more blood, or do you have more sprouting of blood vessels? How does that work? So so I think there's an acute phase and a kind of an equilibrium phase. So what we see, you know, where we say, oh, the liver grows so quickly in two, three weeks growth. Yes, but I think it's more congestion than mm -hmm. really regeneration. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so everything gets congested. The liver, the, all the vessels get congested. The entire liver gets congested um, uh, in the acute phase. I would say the first week or so. Uh, from there, everything starts to grow. But it grows slowly, mm -hmm. and, and at a year, usually we check a year later. Uh, at, at a year, you see a, a normal functional left lobe. You know, vessels look exactly the same say, the same way they looked before, everything looks bigger. But I think at the beginning it's just congestion. So if you get through that phase, because the main issue is congestion. Congestion really kills, kills. it's like like an uh, acute bad Chiari syndrome, uh, and sinusoidal congestion, destruction of hepatocytes. And if you get, you live through that phase, you don't see massive necrosis and the liver slowly will regenerate. <clears throat> yeah, I want to ask you about the criteria for um, leaving donor in ACC. 
are the same as in the cyst donor, or you expand a little bit since the donor caps not from the pool of the cyst patients? So, so first of all, the the recipient uh, HCC patient needs to be accepted as a transplant candidate, regardless of being donor, a deceased donor, or or living donors, and the same. Um, the, the, the same criteria is applied to living donation. Sometimes you can push the limit a little bit uh, uh, in living donation uh, because there are patients with, with liver cancer that they will not get into a disease donor. They will not get priority for cancer, but we still know that those patients, they do well. We know that patients beyond Milan criteria uh, they have a, a 45, 50% five-year survival uh, as, as opposed to 75% in, in patients with Milan criteria. So 50% five-year survival uh, for patients with HCC or for any cancer, it's, it's a really good outcome. If you think about a patient with pancreatic cancer and, and a Whipple, uh, five-year survival is 15%. So 50% is, is really good. So if you select those patients beyond criteria and give the chance of, uh, of transplant, it has to be with a living donor. Uh, uh, and those cases are assessed one by one. No, because in Barcelona, that was exactly the cutoff. So five years, 50% was, was acceptable to assume the risk of donor. And that way is where you can expand a little bit. Exactly, exactly. But this is a, a, any kind of surgical intervention. That the kind kind of surgical oncology is if you do a procedure, a surgical procedure, you had to kind of hope for a 50% five year survival. We don't, we don't really go by that. Yeah, again, I give you an example of, a, of a Whipples. Whipples are five years, so five year survivors are not really good. But, but the theory is that 50% five year survival is what you had to aim for. Amazing regenerative therapies, including things like wind signaling and so forth. One of the potential indications of what we've discussed is small for size. Do you really, if we had a medical therapy for regeneration that occurred that became effective early, would there really be a possibility of helping, or is it too little time and too too much disease dysfunction in the small for size? I think I think there is more for size. I, I think. With donors, I'm not really sure I would really put them at risk. Uh, for the recipient side, that would be good. Um, the problem is more for size, you have to anticipate it. Because when the damage happens, the damage happens, the second you open the clamps and the blood goes into the liver is when you get the necrosis. If you can control that, uh, then probably those those type of... Uh, of uh, uh, Medications or regenerative agents will be very helpful to kind of increase the regeneration. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Um, you mentioned the worldwide mortality rate. Is there any indication of that? Is there any indication of that compared to the U.S. or North America? Is that in line with the 0.5%? Um, and also, do you see us catching up to you know other countries in other parts of the world with major pharma? Transplant is through living related donations. Do you see us catching up? Are we, you know? Um, so, so first of all, it's worldwide because there are not that many. So, in order that you really have a, a big N, um, you have to put all, all, all donors together. And that's why you get to that number. Uh, we had one here, we know. Um, recently, there, there was one in Cleveland Clinic, there was one in, 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 uh, in Colorado. Uh, but there are very, very rare situations. Uh, we learn from every single one. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if we have a U.S. number uh, to say, and this is all over all these years. Um, it would be difficult to really catch up with uh, other countries where living donation is the only option, uh, because here we are very, very regulated. And New York is even more regulated than the rest of the country. We, we have uh, laws here. We, we have mandatory laws that 
no other states have. Um, so there's so so many regulations here that uh, I I don't see that we be able to increase the number of living donations as you see in, in kidney uh, kidney in, uh, living donation. It relates it relates to the receipt, to the donors. You know, for example, uh, they had to be the specific you know age, a specific uh, amount of liver to be removed as mandatory here. And the rest of the countries are like maybe guidelines. But here are really laws. Uh, the, the the how sick the recipient is. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Marcelo. You're welcome.